King. Um, I, I didn't get uh, in the equation you present in the slides why we take this, and now I don't really get uh, yeah the interest. Of <laughs> why it's just to uh, yeah. it's just to start the the state space model. You have to start somewhere. So yeah. we start at the first encounter, and at the first encounter, uh, you need to know the state to to start the time series of states. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cool th the cool thing is that because we condition upon the first capture, you know that you were alive because you were captured at the first occasion. Mm -hmm. So we just say, okay, the first one is one, and then from there you go through uh, through time. So that's the next uh, the next uh, the this big loop here over time. Yeah, and then you. You 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 describe well. You go through time for this particular individual, starting from the first encounter. So the app just gives you the 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 time for each individual, the occasion for each individual at which it was a first capture. So uh, so let me let me show you for example. Can you see uh, here the, yeah. the panel? Yeah. Okay. So F yeah and C yeah. H yeah. Okay. So if I put the two together in a in a matrix, so you see. Ah, okay. So I just built a matrix where I have a. So okay. You have your data set, and then mm. this F says, okay, this this individual here was first captured at occasion one, and mm. then you go down, 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 and then some individuals are captured at the second occasion. So this F is two okay. for this particular individual, and then so on. So it's just an, an index to say, okay, uh, this one was captured at occasion two. Mm. So the Z, the Z for this particular individual at occasion two, but which is the first encounter for this particular individual, is going to be one. It was alive here. We don't mm. know before. Before. We don't know before because we don't care about what happened mm. before because we condition upon the first time you were you were detected. Okay, the vector of the first encounter for each uh, mm -hmm. individual. Okay, cool. Exactly. Merci. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Any idea on the text? Maybe in here. Yeah. Uh, huh. I think, I think it's because, yeah, do you use, um, uh, do you use RStudio or any other, how do you run the code? Yes, RStudio. Okay. Uh, do you have everything in a, in a directory or in a, I mean, you have to have everything in the same, uh, the same directory to make sure that uh, uh, Jags and R can find the the script of the model. Because when we do that, when we do this cat here, it writes, it writes the, the model in this text file here. And uh, as far as I understand, I think that Jack doesn't find the text file when we run it. And so we might need to tell. Uh, okay. Um, you know what? Can you, can you share your screen? It's okay. I can try setting a working directory. Maybe that will help. Yeah, I'll, I'll put everything in the same. In, yeah, it must be that. It must be that uh, we don't find the text file with the model and. Uh, Did you have problems yesterday to run the the, the analysis with Jax? Hmm? 
Nope, all fine. Okay. So it's not a problem with the installation. It must be a problem of a, a path, uh, the, the path of the files that we're using. Uh, Oliver, I have a question. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. About the Dipper uh, data set. So when so I the run the... Data. Yeah, the exercise. Is it not what we are supposed to do? <laughs> are you doing the, the second exercise, no? I think we, I thought you said we have to do two, no? Uh, no, it was just two models in the first exercise. <laughs> okay, then forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if you if you're done with the first, go ahead. I mean, we still have I don't know four minutes, so if you mm -hmm. want to. Uh, yeah, I just wanted uh, to ask right? because yeah, I, if I look at the model results, it says that the uh, the mean mu for male and females is around zero point two, but then when we plot it, it looks like it's around fifty percent. So I wanted to ask why they differ between the summary and between the graphs. Are you looking at the, the posterior mean or median or? Yeah, the, so uh, the posterior mean from the print of the model. Uh -huh. uh, and then afterwards from line 126, you have these two plots, uh, code for two plots. Yeah. And then with the distribution, and then they are all centered around 55. But then when I look at the uh, summary, it's much lower. Are you? Oh. You mean the histograms? No, we look no? at the 126 line for line 126. Yeah. You have the density of the, the mu's for male and female. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah. And so it doesn't, uh, oh. So they look. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to, um, to look at that uh, when we okay. get there. Okay. okay. So, that's that's uh, focus on the weird. simulator. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a look. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. VA. Yeah. Yen. Yes. Could you elaborate on what you meant by um, the understanding parameter redundancy? Well, I'll that? I'll go through that in a in a minute after the when we resume the the, the lecture. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I have a few slides on that. No, no worries. Okay. Uh, I'm. I see. Malcolm, you 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 fix your problem or? Uh, no, I haven't actually. Uh, no, I don't see um. That line. Somebody said line sixty-eight, but I don't see that defined there. Oh, it's it's uh, it's big C big H. Huh? It's case sensitive. Did you use? Ah, okay. Yeah, it might be the, the, the problem, no? Okay, I'll get a kind of look. Let me know. Is it better or? Not there yet, hang on. <laughs> ah. I don't know it's hang on, hang on. I will no. see it. No. But you where are you? Are you oh, well, you're I've the, the the first um error message I get is running line two two nine. Three two nine. <laughs> so <laughs> you've opened which which script are you are you in? The the one lectures or the one exercises? Exercises. Ah, okay. So you are in exercise two already. The one with yeah. the deeper. Oh, okay, yeah. I just wanted you to to rerun the model oh, from the lecture. So, okay, I'd rather on one. Then. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I wasn't clear. Uh, Madan, we're working with a 
this script file called this R script file called lectures CJS models. We're just rerunning the first models just to make sure that we understand everything. And now it's 10.35, so we need to go back to the lectures. Are there any like questions on the on the script or something you really don't understand, you don't get, and uh, it could be a, a problem for for what follows? Or any questions? No. Okay. Okay. So let me share the screen again. Okay. Uh, so I have the recording going on. Everything is on track, I think. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Okay. So so far, what we've considered, we we have considered survival as a kind of a statistical parameter in the model. I haven't said much about the ecology and everything. What does survival actually mean in capture recapture models? The first thing to uh, to to realize is that is that survival refers to the to the study area, to your study area, okay? It, it means that mortality, so one minus the survival, and permanent immigration, the fact that you leave the study area for good, are confounded. You cannot really uh, distinguish between the two. So this is what I mean by survival refers to the study area. Therefore, what we estimate is what we call like apparent survival. It's not true survival. It's apparent survival in the sense that apparent survival is the product of the true survival times the fidelity to the study area. And of course, uh, well, apparent survival is, is always lower than true survival because you have this uh, fidelity factor, or probability, sorry, unless the fidelity is one. So unless uh, you, never, uh, you never leave for good uh, the, the study area in which case apparent and true survival are, are the same. So there are some some ways to account for that. Uh, you, you may combine with um, uh, data on recoveries on, of dead individuals, or you can go spatial, like in the paper that uh, that uh, Michael wrote with, uh, with uh, Andy Roll. And these, these, these techniques can help you to get a bit closer uh, to uh, true survival when you're not sure that uh, fidelity is one. <clears throat> in your study area. Another thing uh, I'd like to attract your attention to is that capture recapture models rely on assumptions. It's true for any statistical models, and capture recapture models make no exceptions. So there are some assumptions that are related to the design of the study. Uh, we, we go through uh, the three main imp uh, most important uh, assumptions. The first one is um, well, marks should should not be lost. I think, for example, uh, of a I don't know, senescence study in which you'd like to estimate survival as a function of age of your individuals. If the individuals uh, lose their maths, then they they get undetected, and eventually, as time goes, these individuals would be assigned to the dead state, to the dead state, sorry, by the model. Hence, uh, inflating the relationship between survival and age. Okay. So you'll get you get a, a false uh, impression of a, of an effect between age and uh, and survival uh, while it's due just to uh, to uh, to the the marks you lose. Okay. The second um, <clears throat> assumption is that individuals should be recorded without errors. Otherwise, you get what we call false positives. It happens a lot, well, a lot, hopefully not a lot, but uh, when you use non-invasive uh, non methods like uh, genetics or photo identification, and you kind of uh, screw up the identifi identif identification process, and you get new individuals that are created and, and seen uh, only once, uh, it's just uh, an already existing individual that you, you, you falsely, uh, you, you, you couldn't uh, identify again. Okay, so you create new individuals, which which uh, which might uh, get you into troubles, uh, depending on what you're working on, like estimating population size, for example. 
uh, third, and it's kind of uh, well, uh, obvious, but it's it's worth uh, repeating it. The individuals you capture uh, should be a random sample of the population you're studying. Okay, if you capture individuals only in a habitat with plenty of food for animals, whereas the population is spread over other habitats as well of lesser quality, then you'll get a biased picture of your survivor. Okay, that's uh, that's a, a classic assumption. And there are also assumptions specific to the model. Uh, in their simplest form, capture and recapture models assume that there is homogeneity in the survival and the recapture probabilities, no individual variation, for example. Obviously, uh, well, individual variation is the driver of many processes in, uh, in ecology and evolution, and we'll see how to relax this assumption in a minute. Another assumption is that individuals should be independent of each other. Otherwise, you get uh, what we call over dispersion. Uh, and when you have over dispersion, the precision you get on, on your estimates uh, is too good to be true. Or said differently, your credible intervals are, are too narrow compared to what they should be. Well, this is due to a dependence among individuals that you do not account for in the model. And instead of having, say, uh, 100 independent uh, statistical units, for example, your individuals, you should consider half of it if your individuals always go in pairs, for example, in pairs, for example, and uh, lower precision and, and wider, wider uh, credible intervals. Does it make sense? Yeah. So a way to uh, address the issue I just mentioned of uh, non-homogeneity or heterogeneity in parameters is to, well, embrace, embrace, embrace heterogeneity. Actually, it's more than just fixing a statistical issue. Right? It's, uh, heterogeneity is what we live for in ecology and evolution. So let's see how to do that in a capture recapture model. We will distinguish temporal versus uh, individual heterogeneity. First, temporal heterogeneity, or year to year or occasion to occasion variation. Uh, to capture uh, and explain this heterogeneity in time, one possibility is to estimate one survival. Uh, parameter per time interval. That's what we saw before. Uh, these are the alphas here. So we say, okay, our general uh, phi parameter, which is uh, individual and time specific, we say it's just uh, uh, a vector of time parameters, alpha. And these are fixed effects in the GLMM, uh, generalized linear mixed model uh, terminology or random effect models uh, terminology. If you're not interested in uh, yearly effects specifically uh, one 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 or the other another option is to go for random effects uh, where you write um, survive that survival on some scale here the logit scale is mu plus epsilon where the epsilons is there a question or anything um, i'm here someone no okay oops sorry so the epsilons are the random effects, and they are uh, distributed as normal distribution with mean zero and uh, and some precision. You remember in JAX the precision uh, one over the the variance. Uh, so that's that's your that's your the the well the variance or the precision of your random effect whatever. Uh, so it's 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 in, in a JAX syntax. Huh? So mu uh, mu here. It's the mean survival on the logic scale. Careful, always remember that it's on the logic scale. So it's linear on the logic scale. So it's your mean survival and, and epsilon here, and, and more specifically the, the, the variance or the precision, whatever you call it. It capture the year to year variation around this mean in survival. Again, on the logic scale, right? So you estimate just two parameters, mu and, and, uh, and the variant. In, instead of uh, one parameter per time uh, interval. Last, you might have an idea of the sources of a uh, temporal variation in survival, in which case uh, you, you may adopt a, a GLM-like uh, uh, approach, and you write the survival uh, as a linear function of a covariate here, x, that is uh, time-dependent, Okay, that captures 
the, the, the variation uh, from one year to the other, or from one occasion, capture occasions to the other. And again, on the logic scale, right? Okay, what about individual heterogeneity? Uh, first, you may have uh, an individual covariate that uh, that explain the differences in survival among individuals. Let's say that uh, you could determine the sex of the of the individuals you you, you surveyed, you monitored. Um, then you can write that survival is either alpha alpha one or alpha two, okay? Where one is for female and two is for male, respectively. And this value is given by the variable group, um, uh, which you plug in alpha here. Uh, through uh, what uh, what we saw yesterday called nested indexing. Okay, so this group variable takes value one if uh, y, if i, sorry, the individual i is a female and group uh, take value two if uh, i is a, is a male, okay? So at the end of the day, you'll get just alpha one and alpha two, which are basically survival for females and males. So group is a vector of length, the number of individuals, and which gives you for each individual, whether it's a female, in case it's one, or a male. Okay. So it's it's another example of nested indexing, which, which is very useful uh, in programming. Instead of a discrete covariate, uh, you may have a continuous individual covariate, like mass or size at birth, for example. And same as before, uh, you use the GLM-like approach and you say, okay, survival on the logic scale is linear, uh, is a linear function of your covariate here, the, the mass or the, the size at birth, and uh, it's specific to individual i, okay? Um, okay, and last, you can use uh, individual under individual random effects to account for individual heterogeneity. So it's the same thing of, uh, as a, uh, a temp time random effect, except that uh, now we uh, we have a, a, an individual index here, i, but it's the same idea. You have an epsilon, so uh, a random effect, which is indexed by the individual, and you uh, uh, it's distributed as a normal distribution with mean zero. And this parameter here, the precision or the variance, is uh, captures the individual heterogeneity, the individual to individual variation in your mean survival. Okay, I cannot see the chat, so let me, oops, I cannot see the chat, so yeah, hopefully uh, Michael or Mark can answer your questions. Uh, yes, <coughs> of, co of course, uh, you can combine both temporal and individual uh, heterogeneity uh, sources in a single model. Um, and this is what we need when we are to implement uh, age effects, for example, in our models. Age is defined is defined here at the individual level, obviously, yeah. but you also need to know uh, time to determine how old or young uh, an individual is. And here we define um, this variable age, let's say with two age classes, young and adult. And age takes the value one uh, if individual i is uh, young at time uh, t, and otherwise uh, value two. Okay, so it's a big matrix with uh, in rows you have your individuals, and in columns you have your occasions of capture. And then you say, okay, for each occasion and each individual, I know whether it was a uh, young or, or or adult, right? And again, you use nested indexing to say, okay. Uh, I go through uh, through age, this variable, through, and I have my two loops, the loop over individual and time, and I can say, okay, uh, when I when I, I was at uh, individual 10, uh, for time three, it was, uh, age was equal to two, so it was an adult, so it's alpha two that applies. I estimate adult survival or young survival, okay? Does it make sense? Again, uh, this nested in indexing um, uh, thing is very, very uh, 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 useful in programming. Okay, important thing to note is that uh, in capture-recapture, age um, corresponds to the time 
elapsed uh, since first encounter, you remember the first capture, it corresponds to true age only for individuals that are marked at birth. Okay. Otherwise, it's just the time that was uh, that was uh, that elapsed since the first uh, encounter. This is very important to remember. Okay. And it will be true age if you uh, if you mark individuals as uh, as young at birth. Okay. Estimate. Uh, maybe you can also estimate the age of uh, your captures uh, when you first capture the individuals. Does it mm -hmm. happen that that uh, the researchers estimate the the age thanks to teeth or things like that, and then you have a, yeah. an estimation of the age at the beginning. So yeah. you kind yeah. of approach you can do that, the yeah. age. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then maybe you, you need use... to estimate the error of your. Estimate, age uh -huh. estimation. <laughs> yeah, so you already in the in the lecture for this afternoon where you have a uncertainty in the unsight, assign, assignment of the, the covariate value to an individual. So you don't know age exactly, but you have some uncertainty and uh, we can account for that in capture recapture model. So it's very recent models, but you can do that. And you can do what you were mentioning. Like if you have the age at first capture, then you can uh, incorporate it. Well, you can use it in this uh, age uh, uh, matrix here. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use a one or two. Uh, you can use the age you've estimated as a, as a covariate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. So besides, uh, in addition to using maybe a categorical time and individual specific covariates, you might want to consider a continuous covariate, say mass or size, or I don't know. Um, okay, so let's say it's X, and now you have an index for individual, but also for time, okay? The, 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 the thing is that to do that, you need to know the value of the, this covariate at every occasion, even when an individual is not captured. Right, uh, and if it's not the case, if you don't know the the value of this covariate when an individual is not captured, well, you have uh, missing values at at capture. Uh, so the cool thing is that the Bayesian framework is useful in that situation because you can have a model on top of the model you have for survival here. You can have a model for the covariate, and this model for the covariate will help you to to fill in the gaps. To, to replace the missing values by by values that we estimate through the model for your covariance. Okay, so let's say you you have mass, uh, and you have a model on mass and the the, the 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 evolution of mass across time for individuals. And then you, if you have missing values at at uh, when you don't detect the individuals, you can replace the missing values by uh, by the values that you estimate with your model. Okay. So there are some examples in the literature of that on that. It's very um, it's very neat, I think. But um, yeah, so it's one reference here. Okay, I was planning. Okay, I'm planning a demonstration. Okay, I didn't remember that. So I'm gonna go through um, a few models with um, <clears throat> with uh, with covariates just to show you how it works. So again, um, let me close those ones. I'm working with this file, which is called Lectures CJS Models, CJS for Comax Receiver Models. And I'm going down, down, down. Uh, random time effects, for example. So that's one model we saw. Um, I'm going to simulate data over 12 capture occasions, again, 50 individuals marked each year. Mean survival is 0.65. The variance on the logic scale in survival, temporal variance in the world is one. And then detection is 0.4, okay? And so this is kind of a, you can have a look to that. We simulate survival on the logic scale so we, we we pick values in a normal distribution, and we pick uh, yeah it's survival. So we have, survival is acting on time intervals. So we have number of occasions minus one uh, survival uh, parameters. Variance, well it's not the variance in R with R norm. It's the standard deviation. 
So we say, okay, it's the variance we've defined uh, at the raised to the power uh, 0.5, okay? So it's the square root. And then uh, because we have the, we do that on the logit scale, we have to apply the logit function. So if you have a look to Q logis, Uh, in R, Q logis is just uh, it's just log of uh, x over one minus x. Okay, it's just a function that is already in R uh, that is uh, programmed in R by default and that applies that. So you define mean survival 0.65 and you generate values for survival on the logit scale. So you need to apply the logit uh, transform transformation. Okay, and this gives you <clears throat> these values here on the logic scale, so between minus and uh, plus infinity. And then you say, okay, now I want the survival probability. So you have to back transform what you just simulated, the values you just simulated using the inverse uh, logic transform. Okay, so it's P logis in R. And you get survival. So these are survival parameters generated from a normal distribution with mean the mean survival, 0.65, and some year-to-year uh, -year variation, which is uh, driven by this variance here, one on the logic scale, okay? And we have everything here between zero and one because we back transform everything. And then we do the same as before. We fill in a, a big uh, matrix of uh, survival values, of detection values, and then we, gen we use exactly the same function, uh, simul, simul uh, dot cjs, to simulate the, the data. Let's have a look. <clears throat> Oops, what did I do? Oh yeah. Okay, so, so let's enlarge this panel. So we have 12 capture occasions and we have a bunch of individuals and for each of them, we have ones and zeros for detection and non-detection, right? As before, we need the date of first encounter for each individual, so the F, okay. right? And then we specify the model. So the model is, is really, the likelihood is exactly the same as before. Like we said, that's the advantage of a, going for something very general. So we have a loop on individual, a loop on time. We get rid of what happens at the first encounter, saying it's a, it's a life at first encounter. And then you have the two equations here, the Bernoulli distribution for survival and the Bernoulli distribution for <coughs> detection, sorry. And then what, what we just need to do now is to say, okay, this parameter is very general. It's uh, individual and time specific. Let's apply some constraint to make it, uh, uh, to, to have a, a survival that is, um, uh, that has a random effect on time. So to do that, I'm gonna say, okay, um, survival for individual i and time occasion t, so between, sorry, between uh, t and t plus one, on the logic scale is a mu, so it's mean survival, plus my random effects uh, over time, epsilon t. And epsilon t is gonna be uh, drawn in a normal distribution with mean zero and some, uh, <clears throat> some uh, precision and the precision is here we say like yesterday like Mike, uh, Michael showed you the precision is one over the, um, the variance so it's sigma raised to the power minus two okay power is for power it's a function in JAGS huh, that you can use or you can just write uh, one over uh, uh, sigma times uh, sigma it works uh, it works perfectly well as well Okay, and the variance is just uh, the standard deviation raised to the power two, right? So this is how we define a random effect in Jack. So you see, it's kind of a, it's kind of intuitive. It's really what we write uh, in equations that we translate in Jack's syntax. So we just say, okay, phi on the logic scale is a mu, uh, mean survival, and some random effects that we we take into, um, we, we, we say our, sorry, they are, well, they, yeah, they are normally distributed with some precision, right? So 
just just ignore that for the moment. We don't need that. And for the detection probability, uh, we just say it's constant. Okay, so all the the detection for for every individual and time occasion are just uh, equal to one parameter min p. And we assign priors, so min p is a uniform distribution as a prior. For the mean survival, uh, we say it's uh, oops. It's my reminder that uh, it's 45 minutes. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, oh, I just remember that we were doing that. Usually, what I would do is is this, and say okay. But why not? I'll say okay. Uh, mu is uh, the prior for mu is a normal distribution. Let's say precision. Let's say 0.1 or something like that. Okay. And then for sigma, the prior is a uniform between 0 and 5. It has to be a uh, positive, uh, the, the standard deviation. So it's between 0 and some value that you take uh, big enough. Okay. And then you run that. Okay. So that's your code. The data. It's the same as before, huh? the detection and detection matrix, the first encounter, the number of individuals, and the number of occasions. It doesn't change. It's the same as for the model for constant parameters. The emits are a bit different because we have initial values for the standard deviation of the random effect and also um, initial values for the detection and for the mean survival. Okay, and the parameters we want to monitor number of iterations, uh, number of chains, and then we run JAGS. So I'm, I'm using a JAGS UI, so I, I specify, okay, um, do that in parallel. So I don't have anything that uh, that uh, that is displayed on the on the panel on the in the console here. So I'm, I don't have the, the the progress bar, for example, which is a bit, uh, sometimes it's cool to have this bar, sometimes it's very depressing when you have very, uh, uh, Models that take uh, a long time to run, but yeah, okay, we're done here. And if you print the results, mean survival is uh, 0.6, roughly, and mean uh, detection is, uh, let's say, well, it's not that far from 0.5, uh, 0.4, which we use to simulate the data, and the variance is, uh, is uh, 1.6. So this is how you fit a model with a, a time random effect. Wow, there are a bunch of questions in the chat. Okay, again, uh, feel free to to interrupt me yeah, to take the take the mic yeah, if you like. Okay, a histogram. Oh, you remember Mark? Yeah, yesterday showed you the Sims list. When you have the results from JAGS, you can access to the values that were generated in the post distribution of every parameter. So this is this big Sims list uh, uh, object here. And we can have a look to only uh, the variance of the random effect. So this is this big, uh, this big uh, thing here. And we can do a histogram of that. So here we go. So that's... Uh, the posterior a histogram for the posterior distribution of, um, of the variance of the random effect, of the temporal random effect. Okay. And you can add the the true value because we generated uh, we generated uh, the values from from some parameters we knew, huh? and this is the the red uh, the solid line here, vertical line. Okay. So well, the 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 mean median of this distribution of the variance of the temporal effect are, is is roughly on the the true value. So it's uh, it's okay. We managed to recover the with the estimates we get. We managed to recover the true value we used uh, to simulate the data. Okay, and there are we're supposed to make a break, huh? To have a break, but um, we have other other models so for example you have a temporal covariance in the same file in the same 
lectures, C, JS, models, script, uh, R script, you have um, uh, something to generate um, uh, values, capture recap recapture data from a model with a covariate. Let's say, I don't know, winter, for example. Winter is, is a covariate, a time covariate, uh, uh, temporal covariate, and you simulate some values over time. And then you say, okay, uh, uh, survival on the logic scale is some mean survival plus the slope times uh, the winter effect, and then some uh, some random variation around that. And you say survival is that is the back transformation of this value. Okay. So that's the relationship between a survival on the logic scale. So it's between minus infinity and plus infinity on the logic scale and the winter covariate. And then, uh, oops. Yeah, so that's the linear relationship between the two that we simulated. And then we fill in the big phi matrix, the P matrix, we simulate data, and then we apply um, the same model. So the model is, um, it's again uh, on the logic scale, we say that survival is a uh, new plus the effect of a, a covariate that is time indexed and some um, some uh, some residual variation uh, over time so this is a very um, very uh, interesting model because we have the effect of the covariate plus some random effect so it's not only um, you could do that just removing the random effects. But in that case, what you would do is, you would assume that all the time variation in survival is, is captured by the variation, the time variation in this covariate X, which is a bit, it's a big assumption to do that. Huh? So if you do, if you add that, this time temporal random effect, it's cool because you say, okay, there is some variation in the, some time variation in the survival that is captured by the covariate and all the residual variation will be captured by the random effect, okay? As in a linear, as a usual uh, um, uh, GLM, but um, well, linear regression, let's say. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice model, and you you may you can run that. Again, the data, the 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 list of data is the same except that now we have the covariates, okay, which is uh, which is new. Initial values, the parameters you want to monitor, number of iterations, and then again you run the JAGS. It takes a more time. Why? Oh, I have three chains and I'm using more iterations, I think. Uh, than before, so it's, it takes a bit more time. Ta -da -da. Uh -huh. What I don't know what this one in Messenger are for. Ah, it's for well, okay. It has nothing to do with the one. That, that's fine. Okay, and if you print print the uh, the results, well, you get the mean survival and you get the slope uh, of the effect of the covariate on survival, which is, um, uh, which is, uh, well, the posterior distribution is is really centered on uh, on negative values, as you can see from the, the credible intervals is minus 1.1 and the upper bound is uh, minus 0.2. So there seems to be a a very strong negative effects of the covariate on survival. And this is how we actually simulated the data, as far as I remember. The winter effect was, where is it? It's there. Beta was minus 03, okay? Cool. Uh, okay, so we're supposed to have a break. It's 10, so let's say we regroup in a, uh yeah to 25 past 11. uh okay uh, just before you leave there are, there are other examples in the script huh, where you can have individual heterogeneity in particular so 
models with individual variation is very, very, very similar to what we just did with temporal variation. So we can have a look. Uh, there is everything in the in this uh, in this script here. And you, if you have any question, uh, uh, I mean, do not hesitate to um, to ask uh, me or Michael or Mark. Okay. Yes, I have a very small technical question. Can go you ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah. just uh, sometimes when you have a very big data set, uh, when you run yeah. your JAX script, it takes a very, very long time and you think, uh -huh. oh no, I'm not going to go uh, this time. And you want to stop the process, but you can yeah. stop the process with the little, you know, uh, stop panel that's uh, yeah. uh, in our studio. So I always wondered, how to stop it because then I have to kill uh, the process uh, somehow, yeah. <laughs> which is annoying yeah. because I lose all my environment and sometimes it's yeah. Yeah. Do you have a? No, <laughs> I don't have any trick to okay. uh, to fix that. No, I do the same. Uh, I kill the, the process and the uh, and screw. But uh, yeah. Another language. It's it does the same when I run a C plus plus script under R Studio. Mm -hmm. It's not able to stop the process, so maybe it's because just it's using another language. <laughs> I don't know. It happens to me uh, well often, uh, even when I don't use another. I don't know. I think oh. it's mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, I don't know if uh, if, um, if anyone else has uh, has advice on that or experience uh, to share. I don't know. For uh, me, it's happened also, but uh, I think it's linked to the memory or the size of object. Uh, for me, it's uh, in R. It's uh, when uh, I have too, uh, too much big object and uh, and it cannot handle in the. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes you. I mean, you have something that is very long to run, and uh, well, you get. Uh, you get tired and you just want to, to, oh. to stop it. And that's the same issue. I mean, that's the same issue. How do you, mm. you, you, you cannot really uh, do that anyway. Well, the cool thing with RStudio is that you can open several, uh, several, in, uh, several uh, uh, instances of RStudio. So you can have something that runs forever and you can still work with another RStudio, another project or. Okay, so I'm gonna have a look to, uh, so we we group at uh, 25, uh, and now I'm gonna have a look to the chat, and I see that. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Okay. 